right. Good morning. There. Good to see each of you. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know you're our honored guest. We're glad that you've come our way uh, and, and been here with us uh, this morning for worship. We hope that you'll stick around for just a few minutes afterwards, give us a chance to meet you. Um, on the back of the pew in front of you, you'll see really three cards. Uh, one of them, the blue one, if you scan the QR code on the back, will kind of give you some information on, uh, on what we do here, times, and, and stuff like that. The other one, if you would, fill out is our visitor's card, and uh, you can just leave it on the pew or put it in one of the collection boxes in the back as you leave up out of here today. Um, if you do have kids and you're visiting with us, we want you to be aware of our children's Bible time, which will happen as we stand and sing after our, uh, after our offering and before the lesson. And... Uh, You'll just see a, a train of kids headed that way. Just follow them and, and we'll get you where you need to be. As we begin our worship this morning, would you bow with me? Almighty God, we're so thankful for this first day of the week and uh, thankful always for an opportunity to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and worship you. Lord, we pray that uh, you'd open our eyes and open our minds and our hearts to all that you have to say to us through your word. And help us to uh, worship in such a way that we show our love and our joy and it spreads encouragement throughout this room. Lord, we love you so much and pray that in all things we glorify you in all that we do. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Let us worship.
glorify thy name. After this song will be directed in prayer. Offer our praise and worship to you. For you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places through your Son. And in that, we have received salvation and a home that is reserved for us that will not fade away. And in connection with that, Father, we observe those blessings together as a family. And we think about those things as we worship together this morning. As we teach one another and encourage one another and are stronger because we're here together doing these things, striving for one goal, having the equally precious faith. Be with us, Father, as we continue in this worship service this morning, that we do so in spirit and in truth, and that we want to be here because we want to be with you forever. Be with the men who direct our minds in worship this morning. May we do everything according to your word and have our Bibles open and have our hearts opened. Thank you for the family that is here, Father, the love that we have one for another, the care that we have for one another. Be with those who are struggling, whether it be spiritually or physically, and be with us to offer comfort and concern and love for them. Thank you for Jesus who cleanses us from all sin who allows us to be born again. And give us the courage and the ability and the knowledge to know that we have a transformed life. And as we leave this place, we go and show that transformed life to the world that we be the light of the earth and the light of the world and the salt of the earth and to help show forth your truth and love to a world that needs it most. Be with us, Father. Thank you for forgiving us our sins. In your Son's name we pray. Amen.
Does everyone have a communion cup? If not, raise your hand, and we will get one to you. One over here. Luke, the fifth chapter, verses 12 and 13, <clears throat> we find an account where Jesus is met by a leper. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Leprosy was a terrible disease. It made you an outcast. No friends, no family. You had to stay outside of the town. You had to wear torn clothes. You had to cover your face from the bottom down. You had to have unkept hair. And you were to cry unclean, unclean, as you walked along. Certainly we understand then why this man begged Jesus that he would cleanse him. You might be wondering, what in the world does that have to do with the Lord's Supper? The next verse tells us the answer that Jesus gave this man. <clears throat> Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. He said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. I am willing. Those three words change that man's life. Are we willing? Our scripture for focus this morning was, or is, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. The writer here compares our life to a race that we are to run. And he tells us that we must lay aside, cast off anything that would hinder us in running that important race. To focus our eyes, fix our eyes upon Jesus. the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we have assembled today upon the first day of the week, Let us, for the next few minutes, cast aside, throw off any thoughts or any worldly matters that might be on our mind at this time, and to center our mind upon Jesus. Yes, he was willing, willing to leave his home in heaven willing to come to this earth and to take on human form, to be flesh and blood. He was willing to endure the effects of the ridicule and the torment and the tempting and the attempts to take his life. 
He was willing to teach man of the new covenant that was to come. And he was willing to die upon that cross to give each of us hope of eternal life, to give mankind a way to be redeemed. So as we prepare to partake of these emblems this morning, let us remember that he was willing, and so should we, as we now center our minds upon Christ and what he has done for each of us. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful to you, so humbled that you would send your son upon this earth and that he was willing to come to give us hope of eternal life through his death upon the cross. We know, Father, that you loved him greatly and he loved you. But he was willing to do this so that we could receive that greatest gift. At this time, as we prepare to partake of this bread, which represents his body, may each of us look to him, casting off all worldly thoughts at this time and center them, center our thoughts upon him and his great sacrifice. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let us pray for the blood which represents his, pray for the fruit of the vine which represents his blood. Father, as we have asked your blessing upon this bread, we now ask your blessing upon the fruit of the vine as it represents that precious blood of your son and our savior. Help us to realize the importance of that wonderful sacrifice. Help us to know and to remember that he gave all and he was willing to do so. May this be a part of our living for you to remember each first day of the week that great sacrifice and what it should mean to each of us. This being our prayer in Christ's name, amen. God sent his son the name of Jesus. He came to God. He had to forgive
Since it is another first day of the week, we have something else that we need to do today, as we do each first day of the week, as we find authority to do this in Scripture, and that is to remember the many, many blessings that God has given us and to give back a portion of which we have been blessed with by God. Paul wrote about contributing quite a few times in the New Testament, especially in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We know that it is to be done upon the first day of the week. We know that it is something that God has set in motion because he wants us to remember to help one another and to see that the needs of the church are met. In the 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which we often read in regard to this, we see that Paul was writing to the members of the various churches. That is who has the responsibility to give. We also find that he did not instruct them to go out into the world and solicit funds. He did not instruct them to make special other collections. He did not specify them to make pledges. But he wanted this to be something that came from our hearts. That which you have purposed in your heart to give today, if you do it correctly in the right manner, and if you are grateful for what God has given you, I am sure that it will be accepted by him. The manner in which we give is is important also. It is to be done, again, knowing that God has blessed us so greatly and that we are cheerfully willing to give back in support of this family here at Central and the work that this church does throughout the world. So we have two boxes in the back that you can place your contribution in if you have not already. And uh, we have other means that you can give Also, if you wish to do that, please check with one of the uh, officers or the deacons. So let's look to the Lord as we prepare to uh, thank him for what he has done for us. Dear Father, we come before you at this time so thankful for the many blessings which we receive each and every day of our life. We thank you, Father, that you have blessed this congregation in such a great way. And we have such a great family here. And today, being the first day of the week as we have assembled, we have this opportunity to give back a portion which you have blessed us with so that the work of this church may go forward and that we will realize the importance of our giving This being our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. If it's convenient for you, let's all stand and sing. I know that my Redeemer lives.
Good morning. It was Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Men, who is accredited with the statement, the main thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. And he's absolutely right in his evaluation of what's needed in our life. And It's true because it is so easy for us to get distracted. The examples are just too numerous for us. I'll have to move it back, I I know. The examples are just too numerous when we talk about, I want to talk about two different areas this morning. I want to talk about the, the family and how the main thing needs to be the main thing. And I want to talk about it in the church, looking at it from two different vantage points. But the, just to talk about the family and how easy it is for us to get distracted is absolutely critical for us to understand. Because there's a lot of people who have, who have so immersed themselves into their work, into their job, their career, that they've done this to such a degree that they... They have forgotten what they're doing the job for, and they've forgotten their family. They've put their family, their wife, or their children aside. And so as a result, oftentimes in that kind of environment, the marriage grows cold, and the children grow indifferent toward their parents because this this singular focus on the job, which is supposed to be to earn money to take care of my family that I so love. And so if that becomes the case, we, we have lost the main thing. And it happens too when we, we get so distracted with other aspects of life. And we, we allow somebody else to turn our head that shouldn't turn our head. And now the relationship that should have been just given to my husband or just to my wife, now my, my, my mind, my gaze begins to see somebody else or some, someone else that creates another distraction, another problem. It might be just life itself that sometimes happens and comes upon us, and we're faced with 
the day-to-day challenges. And we forget that the main thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. And so I, I want to talk about this and address what the scriptures tell us about this. Because it should be very clear to us that, that the main thing is to get this button to work. And then, whoa, wait, wait, there, no, we're going back. That's it, I think. This, these aren't working up here either. I'm really in the, I'm in a state today. It does say the main thing in the home. Yeah, that's a tiny little screen for somebody as blind as I am, is love. And if we forget love, the love that we should have, then it becomes just the lack of main thing. So what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Is this actually confirmed by the Scriptures? Let me suggest to you that, first of all, the husband, the Bible tells us very clearly that the husband is to love his wife. Ephesians chapter 5. You know, one of the things Steve talked about in the class this morning is how do we make our worship better? Let me suggest one, open your Bible and follow along with me. Another idea would be stay awake. We'll see how that works too. Uh, So Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 25. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, that is the church, should be holy and without blemish. Then he goes on to say, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, but he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Well, that's not news, right? I mean, most of us get it. Most of us would would be able to fill in the blank there to say, husbands, blank, your wife, love your wives. We would feel pretty confident But how do we do that? Let me suggest to you some things this morning from the Word of God that would be verified by other Scripture. It says, first of all, I want to suggest to you, if you want to show love to your wife, you need to put aside selfishness, and you need to willingly sacrifice at home. There are some men who don't do that. Some men are so immersed in their job, they're so immersed in their their hobby, they're so immersed in in something in life that they're not willing to sacrifice for the home. They're not willing to sacrifice time, they're not willing to sacrifice energy, they're not willing to sacrifice their, their money. It's all going to go to what they want it to go to. And yet... What I need to do, what you need to do, husbands, you need to be willing to to set aside selfishness and willingly sacrifice at home. Secondly, you need to listen to her when she speaks to you without interrupting. That was really easy for me to type onto my lesson outline. In my office, quiet, It's not always easy to do. And yet, that really is what I need. To show love to my wife, I need to listen to her completely or all the way through, as someone once said. Thirdly, I need to be honest. You need to be honestly open and become vulnerable to make your marriage be what it ought to be. To show love to your wife, you need to be honest in in your evaluation of life and yourself. There's, There's personal honesty who I am, what's going on in my life, what desires and hopes and aspirations I have, where I'd like to see us next year, five years, whatever. It, it's a complete open and honest, but also what's, what are the chinks in my armor? What are the problems that I have in my life? If I can't open up to my wife, whoever could I open up to? She should be the closest person in this world to me. And so I need, <clears throat> I need to be willing to become vulnerable and show that kind of honesty, and show affection without something that has to lead to the bedroom. It is an affection that says, you're special to me, I love you, 
and this is how I feel, if it is special for you, for your wife to sit next to her, then sit next to her. If it's special for you, uh, for her to hold her hand when you go somewhere or to open the door or show whatever kind of affection it is that you show, then as a husband, you need to be willing to do that, to show love for your wife. Remind her that you love her. And then affirm her to your children. Let your children know how special she is to you. Show that to them. Don't just say some words, but show that to them that mom is special. Your mother is somebody special. And you show that you affirm her in front of the children and in front of other people. And then you need to thank her for who she is and for what she does. Someone once said this to husbands, do yourself a favor, love your wife. And that's really what Ephesians 5 is saying, that, that we, we treat ourselves in such a, a way, and he said nobody ever you know, withholds things from themselves, but we, we feed ourselves, we nourish ourselves when we're tired, we rest ourselves. And so I need to be willing to do that and show that kind of love to my wife. Secondly, the flip side of that is true as well. Wives need to lo love their husbands. Titus chapter 2 and verse 4. Titus the preacher is instructed by Paul the apostle, and he is told to, to teach the older women, show the older women, to, so that they will teach and admonish the younger women to love their husbands and to love their children. You see, the Bible says that as a wife, you need to love your husband. So how does that happen? Well, you need to let him know that you appreciate him. Men usually hunger for that, to know that they are appreciated. You need to remind him that you love him, but also that you like him. You like being with him. Not that, well, I, I know I said I loved you, I guess I got to, but I like being with you and I like you. Listen to him without interrupting him. For some that's easy, for some that is not as easy. You need to affirm him in front of the children and in front of others. Let them know that dad is special. And he's special because of this or that or whatever the case is. And you need to focus on what he does right, not always, and I don't mean that's exclusively, but, but not just the things that he does wrong but to focus on what he does right. And then to give him time to be alone. Most women don't get this. <laughs> Let me give you insight. <laughs> Somebody once said, men are like rubber bands, and that is absolutely true. They, they go away, but rubber band comes back. Okay. Sometimes men feel this need I don't know if it's because we're simple-minded <laughs> to, to have to get into this, our quiet, alone place by ourselves. So for some guys, it's the garage that they're working on the car. For some, it's out mowing, working in the yard. For somebody else, it's to go fishing or something else, whatever the case is. But, but sometimes men need that. And then thank him for who he is and what he does. Someone said this one time, and I thought it was well spoken. Unexpected kindness is the most powerful, least costly, and most underrated way of improving your marriage. So you think about that. Thirdly, I would suggest to you that parents have a responsibility to love your children. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 says, And fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath but rather to bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. So how do parents show love to their children? I want to suggest to you that you need to listen to your children and don't dismiss their concerns. When a 15-year-old girl's boyfriend breaks up with her and she feels like it's the end of the world and you know it's not the end of the world, to her it is the end of the world. And so you need to listen with concern and not just to dismiss 
the things that are on their mind. Fortunately, God gave me three sons. Number two, we need to teach them by example and not just by our words. It's one thing to say something to your children. It's another thing to display it. If children grow up in a household where mom and dad are yelling and screaming and fighting all of the time, and then the child gets in trouble for yelling or screaming or saying something, what do you expect? Teach your children by example, not just by words. And then we need to give them time. That is spelled T-I-M-E. It takes time to show love to your children. So you need to support their interests, whether that's ball games or recitals or plays or whatever it is and provide for their needs not necessarily always their wants and one of the greatest ways you show love to your children is by correcting their misbehavior because if you don't other kids don't want to be around them and when they get older other adults don't want to be around them You show love to your children by correcting their misbehaviors. And then remember, even on those days, that they are a gift from God. And there's a flip side to that. Children have a responsibility as well. Children, verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 6, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That doesn't mean as much to us unless we understand in the Old Testament moms and dads could kill their children for them not showing honor and respect to them. So how do you do that? How do children show love to their parents? Number one is you need to talk to them respectfully. You know, greats greats on me, I know it does other people, not just me, when you hear children talk to their parents in ways that you think, if I would have done that, and you fill in the blank of what your parents would have done to you. But talk respectfully to your parents. And you need to listen to them when they talk to you. And thirdly, you need to fulfill your responsibilities as children. If your responsibility is to take out the trash twice a week, then take out the trash. You shouldn't have to be told 97 times. Take out the trash. If it is to clean your room, then clean your room. If it's to mow the yard, then mow the yard. If it's to go to school, then go to school. What, what, What school is the work of children? And you should do your best. If you really want to shock your mom and dad and show them love, ask for their advice and counsel. You need to thank them for who they are and for what they do. How they care for you, how they provide for you. You need to talk favorably of your parents when you're in the company of other people. Even friends at school. And you need to be kind to them. And that's how you show love to your parents. Now, there's other things on all of these that we could look at. But these are ways that you show love. Husbands, wives, parents, children. But I said I want to talk also about the church. You know, there are too many examples and they're too sad for us to go over and to enumerate. The church's in this land, churches that I know some of you all know that have been stunted or divided or destroyed by petty irritations of people, by somebody having a personality difference with somebody else, or with a fear of standing for what's right, because I don't want to offend anybody So we just let everything go until finally it goes completely away. What is the main thing when we talk about 
keeping the main thing the main thing. Well, in the church, surprisingly, it's the exact same thing. It's love. Jesus was asked on one occasion, trying to stump him. The Pharisees heard they had silenced the Sadducees. Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. They gathered together, and then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, said, Teacher, what, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You see, his, his question is, what's the most important thing? In the words of Stephen Covey, what is the main thing? I want to keep the main thing the main thing. What is it? Jesus said unto him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So I want to suggest to you that you need to and I need to love God first and foremost. How do you do that? We need to put him first. We need to gather with his saints because he's told us to. We need to joyfully worship and praise him as we come together. Genuinely thank him for who he is. We need to give our money, our time, our energy, our efforts to God. We need to seek his direction through his word. And we need to honestly communicate with him in prayer. Now there are other ways the Bible is filled with. Them. But these are ways that we as a church need to do this. Put God first. Look for our answers in His Word, not from what somebody tells us or what I think or a podcast I've heard, but what does His Word say? What does He tell me? Secondly, we need to have love for one another. The very next statement, Jesus was asked one question. Jesus gave them two answers. Because Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 39, and there's a second one like unto the first... You shall love your neighbor as yourself, he said. On these two commandments, that is loving God supremely and loving one another like loving our neighbor as ourselves, he said all of it hangs. The law and the prophets hang on that. Everything can be summed up in a sense. That's the main thing. So how do we show love to one another? And we need to listen up because... We need to set aside petty irritations and get over ourselves sometimes. It's easy for us to get thinking so much of ourselves that we forget the greater good and seek the greater good. And consider the feelings of others when we're dealing with whatever it is that we're dealing with. That there are other people involved. It's all part of a family. And one of the greatest ways to show love to one another is to just get busy and get working. Reach out to those who are sick. Reach out to those who are hurting, those who are struggling, those who are facing challenges and trials in their life. Reach out and show them your love and concern. But it kind of comes down to this. We need to get our hearts right. Because it's so easy to, to wear our emotions on our sleeve and feel like we got bumped or bruised by somebody who said this or didn't do that or whatever. I need to get my heart right and seek to try to build up and encourage other people. And there's one other area, and that is that we should have a supreme love for the lost. In Romans chapter 9, Paul says these very surprising words. Verse 1, I tell you the truth. In Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience is also bearing witness with me in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Now listen, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, Paul says, I am so concerned 
about the spiritual welfare of my Jewish brothers and sisters, my family, according to the flesh, that I would give up my salvation if it would save them. I don't, I, I don't think I could say that. I love this church. Been here almost 15 years. I, I don't know that I could honestly say Lord, if you'll save all of them, I'll go to hell for them. I'd like to think I could say that. But I don't know that I could. Paul said, if I could be accursed for my countrymen, he said, I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness. That's the truth. In chapter 10 and verse 1, same book, Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. How do we show love for the lost? Well, first of all, we need to be aware and believe that they are lost and they are headed for hell. I think that's the biggest hurdle that we normally face. We just kind of think, well, they're good people. This is my neighbor. This is my friend. This is part of my family. And we just kind of give it a pass. But I want you to know that if you're not a Christian, if you're old enough that you've sinned, And you're responsible for your actions. Hell is what you have to look forward to. That's not me, and that's not a pleasant thing to say, but it's true. And so Steve told us Jesus was willing. He paid the price. He gave up himself. We need to be aware that people are lost and that they're headed to hell. We need to pray for them. I I still love the statement that Colin made. We need to ask God to send us somebody to preach, to teach. You might be praying somebody would be sent to preach too. We need to be willing to walk through the awkward. That means sometimes I have to get up and walk over to somebody or I need to speak up in a situation and say something that it would be a lot easier just to not say anything. But it's going to be awkward for me to say, actually, that's not exactly right because here's what God says. Or to say, I am concerned about your soul. And I would like to see you saved. And to walk through those awkward moments. And we need to open our lives up to people and let them know that we're no different than anybody else. We're certainly no better than anyone else. We've just been cleaned up by the blood of Jesus. And we need to point them to the Lord. And by all means, when somebody comes to the Lord with all of the mess that their lives may have, that we need to accept them as they are and help them to grow to become the person they should be. Sometimes we expect them to be instant Christians instant good lives but you see a love for the lost is going to prompt us to do this so love is the key love is the answer in the home and in the church 
And I would be remiss if I didn't close by saying, God loves you so much that he was willing. And that Jesus loves you so much that he was willing to give his life for you. Now you can take that lightly or casually, or you can allow those words to sink in and to say, Someone died for me. And so I can live for him. That's God's invitation. He doesn't try to guilt people. He says, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let all who hear say, come. Come. Will you come to the Lord today to accept what He's done for you and allow Him to change your life, to be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ and His blood? That would be our wish, our hope, our desire, and our prayer. If you're willing to do that today, would you come up to the front? Let us know. If you're too shy to do that, then stop me before you leave the building today. Let me know how I can help you. Thank you for being here today. Let's stand and sing this song as we encourage you to. Would you be free from. Yancey has come forward this morning and he's uh, part of this family and has been a part of this family virtually his entire life. Um, and numbers of you know, some of you don't, but that Bo has had an ongoing struggle with addiction and uh, has had some definite challenges in his life. Um, so I want to read what he has written down rather than me um, try to encapsulate this. So the last few years have been a struggle for me and I have fallen short in so many aspects of my life. I especially pray for forgiveness for my pattern of dishonesty to God, myself, 
and my family, which includes everyone here this morning. I know God has put trials in my life for a reason, but I know there's no way I can make it through to live the life he wants for me without all of the love and prayers that have been sent up on my behalf by all of you. And I thank you all for your continued support and will always be regretful for each and every one excuse me, will always be grateful for each and every one of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Bo said, Jody, you know my situation. You can say whatever you want to. I don't know what more to say, uh, except that he's wanting to be in a right relationship with God and a right relationship with the group here. And I think Bo knows as well as anybody that still struggles are in front of him, like there are with all of us. And so we're going to ask you, if you will, to bow with us for prayer at this time. And uh, we just joyfully approach our gracious God. Our Father, we're bowing in your presence today. It's a, there's a heaviness about us um, because of the challenges that Bo has faced and uh, the roads that he's gone down and the ways that he's followed, uh, but such a joy and a happiness and a relief to see your child come home. And as you ran to greet the prodigal, Lord, we run to greet and welcome Bo back we're asking that you would forgive anything that you see in his life that has stead, stood between him and you. And we're praying that you would help us as a family. If there's anything that we've been challenged by or offended in some way, that we'll put those things aside knowing that Bo wants to walk a new path and go a new direction. And God, we're asking you to help him each day and to help us to help him as he walks this journey. We certainly love Bo. We love his family and uh, such an integral part of this group and just asking you to give him the strength and the family the strength that they need to support and encourage him in the ways that are right and to be willing to say and to show him if he heads down a way that's wrong. Help us, Lord to be the kind of people you want us to be. And thank you so very much for your amazing love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We talked in the class this morning about how worship can be and should be emotional. This is one of those times. Love you, Bo. And we welcome all of you today. Glad you were able to be with us. I have a few announcements. If you've not already gotten an announcement sheet, please pick one up before you leave. Uh, a couple items on our sick list. First of all, uh, an update on Rains Jackson. Surgery for Reigns was successful, and he is recovering as expected at this time, still in the hospital. Uh, the Jacksons and Reigns family, thank you for your prayers, and please continue uh, your prayers through Reigns recovery, and we're certainly a joy about that. Also, we just found out that Betty Williamson was uh, admitted to Advent Hospital last night. Don't really know what her situation is, so uh, keep uh, Betty in your prayers. Uh, Albert Johnson had surgery, successful surgery last week, uh, and uh, so he is continuing to recuperate. I believe he's still in the hospital, but will be going to rehab uh, shortly. Small groups meet today, and if you're a part of that, please uh, uh, join your group. If you're not part of the small group program, please be back here at 6 uh, for a, a uh, service here at 6 o'clock. Also remember the bridge 
service is next Sunday. Those of you who are part of that, uh, that, that work, please uh, be aware of that and take part. One of the, we believe one of the wonderful things about uh, a growing congregation is that men continually step up to be part of the leadership. And the shepherds are pleased to announce that uh, we have asked two men to serve as deacons of this congregation. They are Brother Jeffrey Burnett and Brother Randy Cameron. And uh, won't you please to uh, uh, talk to these men over the next three weeks or so, uh, get to know them if you don't know them well yet, uh, ask them about their work, and uh, in three weeks we will be appointing them as deacons of this congregation. And once again, we thank all of you for being here today. If you're a guest, we hope you will stay around for a few minutes so we get to meet you. If you're traveling, we wish you Godspeed. And as we leave today, let's all go out and share the wonderful message of Jesus Christ with those we come in contact with. Let's all stand together. We'll have a closing song and then be dismissed in prayer. point inward to me a lot of times and I know others can get from that but right now I want to sing this we want to sing this song and I want you to I'm singing it to you we're singing it to you we're singing it to each other break my heart break my heart did not know that I was going to be leading the open prayer until just before services start. I always like to have a few days to think about what I'm going to pray about. But I want to make this statement. I did not know what Jody was going to preach on. But I had prepared to let this congregation know that this time of the year, there's all kinds of things going on about teams. There's football. There's baseball. There's all kinds of teams. But I want to tell you folks, Barbara and I learned this week that we're on the best team that a person can possibly have. And on this earth right now for us, it's the Central Church of Christ. 
Let's pray. Dear God, we pray that you would help us here, all of us, to keep the main thing the main thing. Dear God, we know that the family is so critical to the growth of the Lord's body wherever it may be. Help us, Lord, for husbands to love wives and wives to love husbands and for those parents to bring them up in the way that those children should go. And as they are at the earliest possible learning age, teach those children and help the parents teach those children what it is to love one another and to be what they should be according to the word of God. Lord, we just pray, we pray, Lord, that keep us in your mighty hand till our faith will become sight one day for those of us that are going to be moving on and that you'll keep us in that mighty hand till the storms of this life pass us by. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.